Again. Thank you everybody for joining us here. Uh, today is the fifth Sunday of Great Lent and I hope that you all had the chance to read the gospel passage um, before logging on. But just as a reminder, the gospel is from John chapter 5 verses 1 through 18. And during this uh, passage, we meet the man who is uh, paralyzed for 38 years. And this gospel passage shouldn't be new for us. Um, we know that every time that he tried to enter into the water by himself, that uh, he was beat to it. Somebody else was going to the water before him, and they received the healing before he did. And our Lord saw him in verse 6. And he asked him, and he knew that he was in that condition for a long time. And he asked him a very clear question. Do you want to be made well? And it's a question for each one of us. But he asks this man a question. Do you want to be made well? And the man answered very interestingly, I think. He says, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And our Lord says, okay, forget about the water for a second. In verse 8, he says, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well and he took up his bed and he walked. And then during... The second part of this passage from verses 10 through 18, uh, there was beginning a dialogue between wanting to accuse God um, and who made you well and all these kind of things. Our Lord finds this man in verse 14 in the temple. And he said to him, see that you have been made well, sin no more unless a worse thing come upon you. Um, and the man told the Jews and these kind of dialogue uh, went back and forth between um, those who wanted to kill Christ and, and the man who was made well. And so, again, we enter the fifth Sunday of Lent, and it's kind of hard to imagine that this is the fifth Sunday. It, time is, is blurred. Uh, I don't know if about you, but like the days are getting confused, and I can't believe that we're progressing so quickly through Lent. And we, are, we see the man who hasn't moved for 38 years, and Again, it must have been disheartening to see others being healed before him. Uh, and he had no one to help him and to get into the pool. And so he felt stuck. He was unable to move. He was unable to heal himself. He was unable to receive God's blessing. And I think, I don't know about you, but I can relate, especially with the context of society today. I think we all feel a little bit stuck. We all feel like we can't move. We all can't do things for ourselves. And I, I think that... Um, it is a blessing that we can contemplate on this passage for today. It was once said, uh, a famous doctor was asked to name the most devastating disease. And he replied with loneliness. You would think coronavirus, you would think something like that. But he said loneliness is the, is the worst disease to mankind. The most devastating the sickness of our age. Loneliness can make people go into very uh, desperate things. Loneliness does not discriminate against age. Uh, for example, the one who is a small child who's feeling lonely, um, maybe it's because the parents haven't spent enough time with them when they were little. There's loneliness in teenagers uh, who feel like they're misunderstood or people don't, um, they feel alienated. There's loneliness that can occur in marriages where two people can live under the same roof but be uh, you know, roommates in a way. There's loneliness in elders who feel disconnected oftentimes. And so loneliness can plague all of us. And I think with what's going on in our culture today, it's something that we have to really pay attention to. And we can see how our Lord helps us overcome. In this passage of John chapter five, we see the disease here. It's in this line where, our, where he says, sir, I have no man. This is loneliness. And in the paralytic in the gospel, he portrays himself as a victim of his own circumstances. He says, there is no one to help me. There's no one to help me. He can't imagine any way out of his situation. And so we see, not only is he paralyzed physically, but he's also paralyzed spiritually and emotionally as well. And this is how we define spiritual paralysis. Um, we can talk about the physical side of it, but I want to focus on the spiritual side of it. It's you want to do the right thing. You want to do 
um, the things like praying and reading your scripture and fasting, and but we become distracted, and interruptions of life happen, and we don't get to really focus on the priorities that are really important to us. And a, a deeper level of the spiritual analysis, uh, uh, paralysis is you don't even have the desire to do those positive things anymore. You don't even have the desire to pray. You don't even have the desire. Uh, to fast and things like that. Sometimes we feel like life is out of control. We feel like, and I think all of us can relate, especially nowadays, that, you know, we all, we all can experience this emotional and spiritual paralysis in our own lives. We experience life as being out of control and we feel ourselves as a victim of our circumstances that are around us. I want to point out that the hunger of God is is one of the causes for loneliness. Maybe we're not aware of it. It's actually a positive way to look at this. Um, it's only the relationship with God that can satisfy our loneliness and our, our um, deep yearning for God. It's only he who can make us complete. Um, we understand sin, rightfully so, as being separation from God. And... This causes loneliness. Um, when we are separated from God, we, we are separated not only from God, but we're separated from our best, our best self. We're separated from our fellow man. Um, loneliness is an is a emptiness. It's a craving to be filled with our Lord Jesus Christ. Only he can give us a sense of importance and worth uh, of life and a sense of direction and a power that never fails. Only he can give us the meaningful purpose uh, that we lack uh, and, and which causes a deep inner loneliness. So our Lord Jesus Christ came to be our savior to destroy the damage that is caused by sin, to reunite us with God, to reconcile us with God, and to reconcile us with our best selves and our, and our fellow mankind. So when we encounter Christ in this gospel passage today, we encounter hope. We encounter hope. Just like the paralytic did. Um, Christ says there is a way out of the box that traps us. And we all feel like we're in a, in a box, so to speak. Um, this mental and spiritual paralysis that we, that we feel makes us hopeless and helpless. Our Lord says, get up and walk. Get up and walk. He says there is a way out. There is hope. There is the reality of the kingdom of God. Um, and, you know, as, as we who are the body of Christ, we are also to be the presence of Christ to others who are equally trapped and equally paralyzed, and equally helpless and hopeless. We are to be the bearers of the message of get up and walk. But we have to remember it ourselves. We have to remember it ourselves. See, in the, in the scripture, we are constantly reminded of amazing promises by God. We are, we are blessed with a God who stays with us, even in, in challenging times of our lives. We remember that God is with us, that even though that we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that he is with me always, always, um, even to the end of the world. And so we remember there is a cure for any state that we're in any kind of spiritual paralysis that we're in, any kind of loneliness that we, we face, there is a cure. It's the forgiveness of our sins. And so I'm not necessarily talking about a vaccine for a virus, so to speak. I'm talking about uh, a more meaningful cure in our lives as human beings to, to wash away our sins and to renew our minds and to retrain our bodies and to soften our hearts. And it starts with confession. Even though we can't, physically meet with um, in the congregation, in the church, and, and take the communion, we can, still, we can still participate with the sacrament of confession. And through confession, we're reminded of the need to pray, and the need to worship, and the need to fast, and to enhance our lives with scripture, and, and to love our neighbors. And so I encourage all of us to never forget that we can still partake of confession um, even remotely if we need to. Uh, we are to help open the hearts and the minds and the souls 
of this greater reality of the kingdom of God and not to be trapped into uh, our circumstances here on earth. And so we are to bring this, uh, the kingdom of God, which helps us remind us that there is a greater um, reality than the one that we face today. And so we have to be ready to carry our beds uh, because, yeah, they, they might be reminders of our sins and our weaknesses. Oftentimes, I think, though, we, we pay too much attention to the negative thoughts. Um, and we find it impossible to believe that we've really been forgiven. Um, we become obsessed with whatever challenges that, and difficulties that we face. And sometimes you blow them out of proportion. And we think sometimes that those things are more powerful and more real than our Lord who has conquered sin and death. Right? We think that the coronavirus has more power than Christ himself. And, and things like this. And so we have to be careful that we don't become obsessed and we don't become um, completely consumed with these negative thoughts. We have to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ can cure us with the word. Maybe he can cure us with the coronavirus. That's up to our faith. But he can cure us with a word from our spiritual paralysis, which I think is more deadly uh, than any kind of coronavirus that's out there. And sometimes that word comes from a spiritual father or uh, the texts, the scripture, um, a faithful servant, someone that's uh, very close to us. And so that word can come from um, very different avenues, but we have to be ready and open for those things. But be careful because there is a false cure and a real cure. The false cures for loneliness um, and spiritual paralysis, they're many, and they're, and they're readily available. Among them can be ways of prodigal living, um, escapism, um, trying to find uh, ways to cope with our negative situations, with things that are very negative. Um, but be careful, because they actually leave us more lonely and more uh, distant from God than ever before. So we have to be careful of the, of the false cures. Sometimes we, we even go to an extreme and we work excessively um, so that we can schedule our, uh, we can have our schedules filled to the minute so that we're never alone, so to speak. But again, this can lead us to a, a deeper loneliness than we ever felt before. So we have to be careful of the, of the false cures that sometimes we fall trapped to. So what is the real cure? Our Lord in the gospel today presents us with four models of healing. He says, do you want to be, you have to pay attention to the commands that he gives the, the man. He says, do you want to be made well? He says, rise, take up your bed and walk. He says, see that you have been made well and sin no more unless a worse thing comes upon you. Let's take a look at each one. In verse six, he says, do you want to be made well? And I take this question very personal. It's a question for each one of us. Sometimes when we, um, when we talk with our fathers of confession and we talk about wanting to pray and wanting to fast and wanting to read a spiritual book and wanting to engage in the, um, in the spiritual disciplines, it's a question that we all have to think about it. Do we want, do we really want it? And if we did, I think our behaviors and our um, engagement with the spiritual disciplines would be very different. He, he directs this question to each one of us very personally. We have to want and desire this healing and this change in our lives. Um, our will must cooperate with God's will. Our desire to be made well uh, is what gets us to, to be in the place where we need to be. In other words, what was this reason why the paralytic, along with the sick and the, and the blind and the lame and the paralyzed, why were they at the pool in the first place? Because they all knew that when the angels stirred the water, that they had a chance to be, to be healed. In other words, if the paralytic did not want to be healed, he wouldn't be there. And he wouldn't have encountered Christ, uh, who is the true physician of our, of our souls and our bodies. Whenever we feel sick, our desire for healing motivates us to the medicine cabinet and to the doctor. And 
oftentimes we hear someone who is who is gravely sick and we hear their survival stories about um it comes down to their will to live it was their will to live and so only medical technology can take us so far and it has limits our desire to be made well um to become whole again not just physically again that to me is secondary but not just to become whole physically but to be whole spiritually uh, to be connected with god to be reunited with god uh, is what causes us to pray what motivates us to pray and to uh, go to the church and to partake of confession so our lord asks us do you want to be made well the second thing that he says is rise and take up your bed and walk and this is in verse 8 of the passage today rise take up your bed and walk our lord could have easily said you know you are healed done next next person um but our Lord commands the paralytic to pick up his bed and to walk. And this statement implies that the paralytic must take an active role in his own healing. Um, our Lord Jesus Christ knew that his command would cause the paralytic to be confronted by the legalistic Jewish authorities. Why? Because he broke the Sabbath law. And also with our own healing, we will encounter obstacles. We will encounter obstacles to our own healing. And so we have to participate with our own healing. It can't be a passive experience, in other words. Our Lord is not going to do everything for us. No, we have to get out of our beds. We have to go to the medicine cabinet. We have to go to the, to the drive through doctor station, and we have to follow the direction of the doctor. Our doctor says, do this and don't do that. When we pray, when we read the scripture, when we go to church, when we receive the sacraments, the priest, we have to follow the priest's direction where the priest says, do this and don't do that, in other words. So many illnesses, both spiritual and physical, are the result of unhealthy habits. Healing implies change, moving away from unhealthy lifestyles. And so when we repent, we change the mind, uh, and it's a whole new approach to life. So we can't be healed if we're unwilling to change, if we're unwilling to participate in our own healing. Our Lord then says, see that you have been made well, in verse 14. See that you have been made well. And it's interesting, and it's a reminder for each one of us, uh, the, the paralytic went to the, to the temple, after he was made healed, uh, when he was made whole again, he went to the temple and our Lord found him there. And it, it's, it's a reminder for each one of us, when we receive blessings from God, where does God find us afterwards? Are, do we have um, a level of thanksgiving? Do we, do we turn to God uh, more and more every time that we receive healing? We have to remember that it was our Lord Jesus Christ who healed us and not, um, it's not coming from anywhere else. We have to give glory and we have to give thanks to God whenever we receive the blessings from God. And we shouldn't think that we have been healed without God's hand. So I pray that, you know, medical technology can, can create a vaccine or a cure or these kind of things for these viruses that are plaguing us. But we have to remember that it is not without God's help. And without God's healing hand, that we are blessed through the medical technology. If we think that our life is better or more full or more whole, um, and God had little or nothing to do with it, then then we've then we've missed the mark. Then we we have a complete wrong understanding of what's happening. But if we humbly acknowledge God has done most of the work in our healing, uh, then we open ourselves to further healing, and then we can grow. And, and we have to remember that healing is not a one-time event. Our Lord says, see that you have been made well. So understand that this healing has come from God. Acknowledge and be thankful to God. And then he says, sin no more unless a worse thing comes upon you. Why would he say this? Why would he say this? 
was the paralyzed man, was he sick because of some previous sin? Maybe, maybe not. But our Lord is drawing the spiritual and the physical together to understand that, that sin is worse than a physical paralysis. Sin is worse. <coughs> you might say, what can be worse than, than being physically paralyzed? No, we have to understand that sin causes a separation from God. And this is worse. This is worse than being physically sick. And so, and so we have to remember that any physical, any physical harm uh, is worse than any spiritual uh, uh, separation that we have from God. And so we live in a world, unfortunately, that is so focused on physical appearance. And, and so we minimize the spiritual illnesses and we become oblivious to them. It's, it's, we have to be careful because we realize it's very sad uh, that we work on an outward appearance, but there's an inner infection growing within us. And we have to be careful that we don't, we don't become oblivious to the spiritual illnesses that we face. We have to understand and be aware of the, of the moral behaviors and the spiritual health that we, that we have to pay attention to. And this leads me to, this, to the guidance of the spiritual father and why they're so important in, in the Orthodox Church. The spiritual father is there to help us and to guide us towards a proper healing and, and again, the corresponding forgiveness of sins, which is more important than any physical illness that can, that can plague us. The spiritual father can help lift the weights of sin that, that presses on our souls and keeps us growing, from, uh, growing towards God. And so we have to really take the advice and, and run to our father confession for confessions um, during these times and so to conclude i just wanted to have a few thoughts the paralytic just to summarize and conclude um, the paralytic in the gospel today gives us a glimpse of someone who portrays himself as a as a helpless victim of circumstances in other words he says there's no one to help me and he is plagued with loneliness and he can't imagine himself out of his own paralysis out of his own state and so he is paralyzed not only physically, but also spiritually as well. And I want to point out that we too are also plagued with the spiritual paralysis, um, emotional paralysis in our lives. We experience the same kind of, of, of experience where we feel like our lives are out of control. Um, <clears throat> that we feel like our lives are, are out of control and we can't see ourselves as going beyond um, this, these circumstances in our own lives. And so merely wishing for healing is not enough. We have to take action in order for God to, uh, to reach out his hand and to guide us. We have to uh, act in a, in a healthy and righteous, holy ways uh, so that we don't have another crisis in our souls. We have to acknowledge to ourselves and to others that it is our Lord Jesus Christ who heals our bodies and our minds and our souls. Um, and he is con in complete control of our situations. And so we have to do our very best to sin no more so that something worse doesn't happen to us. Um, we may fall again. But it doesn't mean that we stop trying. It doesn't mean that we just simply become a paralytic that is waiting for something good to happen to our lives. Repentance means that we start uh, learning about what has plagued us, what has tripped us up, and we carry our beds as a reminder so that we can avoid our pitfalls in life. We too can have our Lord Jesus Christ um, as our a uh, friend and our companion to make us strong uh, when we who by ourselves would be made weak. Um, our Lord gives us courage when we ourselves are faint-hearted. Our Lord gives us the promise of his presence when we would be lost in loneliness. Um, and with this faith, we still have 
problems, but we also have the presence of him who inspires confidence and conquers loneliness. And so we pray that we ask for strength to rise with him and to rise up from whatever sin has weighed us down. And we find strength uh, in his resurrection to overcome uh, our paralysis and the fears uh, that plague us. And we move step by step day to day uh, into the joy of his kingdom. Uh, now is the time to take up our beds and glory be to God forever. Amen. I wanted to remind you all that we're starting with um, just to switch gears a little bit. If you visit the website or the Facebook page and you go to the virtual spirituality tab or you can follow the link, um, you're going to find the, the schedule for the Sunday school. And we're trying this out. Uh, we have different links for the different classes and we staggered the times. So at 10 o'clock, uh, we'll start the first four classes. Um, and so we wanted to be conscious of the um, device sharing that might be happening in the homes. Uh, that we don't have necessarily a device for every individual in the house. So we wanted to stagger the times. And so preschool, first and second, fifth and sixth in high school will go first at 10 o'clock. And then around 1045, the baby and me class, the kinder class, the third and fourth, and the junior high will go at 1045. And they're going to be short sessions. Um, we understand that there is the um, complication of talking over one another in the classes. So uh, this is merely a time for us to see familiar faces, to see your Sunday school servant, to kind of uh, to make sure that we connect in this way. And so uh, try not to get frustrated with the content or, you know, I'm sure most of the servants have already given the lessons before today and recordings and um, drafts of the lessons and the, the different talking points for the lessons. But this is merely a time for us to reconnect as a congregation with our different classes for Sunday school um, and to, to go that route. So unless there's any questions, Abuna, if you had any questions or comments or anything that you'd like to add. Um, no, thank you. Um, I think everything is going smoothly, thank God. Um, does anyone else have any other questions or announcements or anything? And I just wanted to point out for the Sunday School links, if you're having a hard time logging on, uh, make sure that you reach out to the servants of your class to, to help you get on. So the servants made their own links, just so everybody's aware. Um, so if you're having trouble logging on to preschool, make sure that we're reaching out to the preschool servants uh, to help log on and to troubleshoot. And we'll help as much as possible. Um, but the links are out of our control uh, for the clergy. So make sure that you reach out to your servants. Does anyone have any questions on uh, Buna's talk? Thank you, Abuna. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. Okay, we'll stop. Uh, I'll stop the the talk for today, and we'll we'll get ready for the Sunday school at ten o'clock. Okay. See you all soon again. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.